welcome to the John Muir National Historic Site. I'm Ron Good, a park ranger here at the site. I'm really glad you're here with us today. Uh, I've been um, a big fan of John Muir for many years, and I followed in his footsteps personally and professionally, and I hope you'll be inspired to do, to do so as well. Now, this is one of about 400 sites we have in our National Park Service system. Have you been to other Park Service sites? What ones have you been to? Bernie Falls, isn't that part of the Park Service? We just came from there like last week. Then we're going to Humboldt State Park, Redwood State Park, which is part of the National Park System. Yeah, it's kind of a joint state and federal. Good. And where are you folks from? We're from Sacramento, she's from Louisiana, she's from Martinez. Okay, good. It's, yeah, it's nice to have someone from Martinez around here. Okay. And the first time here. Is that right? <laughs> That's great. We have John. Hi, hi kids. How are you doing today? Is there other people with you? Yeah, my mom's um, leaving the stroller. Okay. All right, well, the stroller. well, John Muir um, is oftentimes called the father of our national parks because of his involvement with the Hi, with the creation of several of our early national parks. Here in California, Kings Canyon, Sequoia, and Yosemite. In Arizona, Petrified Forest National Park, and Grand Canyon. In Washington State, Mount Rainier National Park. You know what, I you think I hear John Muir coming down the stairs. Well, now there you are, oh, welcome. Pretty good to have John Muir himself welcome us to his house, isn't it? Actually, that's an actor named Lee Stetson, who's been an actor in Yosemite Valley for 30 years or so, portraying John Muir, and he's done that all over the world, actually. When John Muir lived in this house, a big event happened in the San Francisco Bay Area in 1906. What do you think that was? An, an earthquake, earthquake wasn't fire. it? Right, big earthquake and followed by the fire, exactly. Well, a couple of the fireplaces, actually three or four of the fireplaces here in the house were damaged. And couple, one in particular downstairs here, I'm going to ask you, which one do you think John Muir had a hand in rebuilding? The one here in the east parlor or the one over there in the west parlor? The east parlor. This one over here? That is right. And why do you think that? What, 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 it's rustic. What tells you about John, what speaks John Muir about that fireplace? It's rustic. Mm -hmm. Rustic. Mm -hmm. Big. Big, yeah, yeah. Good answers, yeah, for sure. He said he wanted to have an indoor campfire here in the house, and that's what he got. So he could sit there and act like he was at a campfire. Well, John Muir lived in this house for almost 25 years, but his true home was the mountains, and the mountains inspired him to encourage all of us to enjoy and explore and preserve the earth. Muir said, going to the mountains is going home. You climb the mountains and get their good tidings. Nature's peace will flow into you as sunshine flows into trees. The winds will blow their own freshness into you, and the storms their energy, while cares will drop off like autumn leaves. Imagine your care dropping off like autumn leaves when you're out in the mountains, right? One of Muir's favorite mountain homes was Yosemite, a place where you mentioned before. And these are images of Yosemite National Park by the famous skies painter, William Keith. Now Keith was a, a, born the same year that John Muir was, 1838, in Scotland as well. Now this is of course the Yosemite Fall, upper fall, the middle cascade, and the lower fall, and the Merced River going through the valley. And over here is the Tuolumne Meadows at 9,000 feet above sea level, with Limbert Dome, Dana, and Gibbs as well. And over here, Vernal Fall on the east side, the east end of the valley, Yosemite Valley, and it's a little over 300 feet, not quite twice as tall as, as the uh, Niagara Fall in New York City. 
One time John Muir was in Yosemite Valley and he decided to climb back up behind Yosemite Fall there. And he got up there and he saw this little three inch ledge and he thought, oh boy, I'd like to go out there, but it's just too dangerous. I don't think I can make it. I don't think I should go out there. But then I did. <laughs> and he said he had a, it was a glorious display of pure wildness. And he stayed out there and enjoyed the great cascading thunderous water all around him. And he said, it was, and so he had just a grand, glorious time. He said, how he got off that three-inch ledge, I'll never know. <laughs> but he was all nerve-shaken when he got back to camp that night. He didn't sleep much that night. Another time Muir was out of the mountains near the Yuba River, and it was rainy and windy. It was a John Muir kind of day. And Muir decided to go out and see what nature had to teach him. And he got out there, and, and the, the wind was blowing the trees horizontally and vertically, and some were even uprooted all together. And he saw a grove of, of Douglas fir trees, and he picked out one that was about 100 feet tall and decided to climb up into the top of the tree as it swished back and forth. And he said he felt like a bobolink on a reed. He said it was an exhilaratingly spiritual experience. He said, some, he said we all travel the Milky Way together, trees and men. Another time Muir was out in the mountains here in Yosemite Valley, and I had the good uh, fortune to live in Yosemite Valley for four years and got to be there all year round and see its many seasons, all of its seasons. And well Muir got up there and it was uh, winter time and he was going up in the Indian Canyon which is just east of the Yosemite Fall there and all of a sudden he got swooshed down in an avalanche. He says the one only avalanche he's ever experienced. Any of you folks ever ridden down an avalanche before? No. No? Well, he said another ex exhilarating experience for him. He said he, but he survived without a scar or a bruise. Pretty amazing. Well, when Muir lived in Yosemite Valley, he lived in this one room little cabin here in Yosemite Valley. And he made with, um, with wood that had been cut from, from trees that had <coughs> excuse me, blown down in a windstorm. <coughs> oh, excuse me. <coughs> I had to get a drink of water. And here's a semi fall and he, he did this drawing. I'm going to get some water. <coughs> excuse me. He did this drawing. He did a lot of drawings out in, in, the, in the mountains. And um, <coughs> he shared the, the cabin with a three frogs and a rattlesnake. So maybe you folks have done that before. <coughs> Not likely. I've actually right. been around rattlesnakes. <laughs> <laughs> well, one question I'm going to ask you folks is how in the world John Muir got from this one room little cabin in Yosemite Valley to this grand 10,000 square foot mansion. And we're going to explore that as we go into the library in the next room. I'm going to get a cough drop as we go into the, into the other room. Okay, well, I'll ask you folks how in the world John Muir got from this one room little cabin in Yosemite Valley, this great 10,000 square foot mansion here in Martinez. What do you think? How did he do that? His wife. He worked. He worked? What do you think? He inherited it from his wife's dad or something like that. Well, you're, you're both on the right track. He married well. Okay? So uh, we had some folks from South Carolina here the other day, and they said he married up. 
<laughs> Which he did. He was 41 when he got married, and he was kind of a tramp guy. He'd been out in the mountains quite a bit, but he was a pretty well known fellow. He'd done a lot of the explorations in the, in the, you know, the glaciers in Yosemite, and a pretty well known fellow. And he married Louisa Strenso, and she was 33 when they got married. And uh, they had these two beautiful girls. There you go. Mom and Helen Juan were born about a year after they got married, and Helen five years later. And he really doted on these two girls and took them on walks up here on Mount Wanda quite a bit. And Helen said, Well, what about me? Well, there's a Mount Helen up there, too. <laughs> Just for her. So they got married one week shy of your 42nd birthday on April 14, 1880. And I don't know why they didn't get married on their on his 42nd birthday. But maybe some historian will figure that out someday. And he married into the Strinzel family. And this is Louisa's father here, Dr. John Strinzel, a medical doctor, and mother, Louisiana Strinzel. And the connection between the Muirs and Strinzels revolved around plants. They both loved plants. He was a botanist and loved to be out uh, with, with the plants. And a mutual friend from the University of Wisconsin had introduced Muir with Dr. Strinzel. Muir had gone to the university for two and a half years and studied botany and geology. And, and this, a wife of one of the professors there, Jean Carr, introduced Muir with the Strinzels. And they got to know each other. And Muir would sometimes come out here to Martinez and visit the Strinzels when they lived in this house about a mile away from here. And unfortunately, this house is burned down. And this is a house that was given as a wedding present. Dr. and Mrs. Strinzel gave this house as a wedding present to John and Louisa when they got married. So, hi, thanks for coming. Muir worked really very hard here on the ranch. And there were, uh, did anybody here like peaches, pears, plums, apples, grapes? All of it. All right, well, that's what they had here. 2,600 acres of land, you can imagine that. Here's the house, and 2,600 acres of land. And to work all that, all, with all that fruit, they had to have a lot of workers, Chinese laborers here in California, helped on all the little ranches, and helped build the railroads and gold mining as well. So it was good, hardworking folks. But they had also negotiated with the railroad here, to, so near, uh, had the railroad pay him $10 so they could build a railroad through his property, he could ship his fruit out all over the country, and they got to ride the railroad for free you know, in, in different places. Somebody's getting a little bit upset. Maybe it's something I <laughs> He wants said. to know more. Tell me more. Huh. Here's another image of the house. You, know, you see the two palm trees here, and they were small, so Kids do grow up, don't they? Mm. All right. Well, this was Dr. John Strinzel's library, and that's one of the original pieces of furniture we have here in the house. He was a apothecary. We kept his medicines and books as well, and kept the sick folks out in his office out there so they wouldn't come in and infect folks here in the house. And the other original piece of furniture we have in the house is upstairs. John Muir's writing desk upstairs in his scribbled den. We'll go up there in a little bit. Well, we're going to explore a little bit more about Louisa's life, his wife's life, as we go into the west part of there. Sacramento River, which later became Mills College in Oakland. 
She also was classically trained in the piano. This is not the original piano, but it's one that was donated to us by a family here in Martinez, and it's out of that time period. The original piano is with some of the great-grandchildren now. Uh, Wanda married a fellow named Tom Hanna. They had six kids. Helen had four children, so Muir had ten grandchildren all together. And the piano went down to the, some folks in the Hannah, in the Hannah family there. But she would oftentimes entertain right here in this room and play the, play the piano. She was also a suffragist. In other words, she felt that women should have the right to vote. Imagine that. <laughs> that uh, when she was married in 1880, women couldn't have the right to vote until 1919. That's when the 19th Amendment was ratified for the United States Constitution. Well, here's an image of John Muir, who, who uh, worked very hard here on the ranch. And uh, here he is out with the great grapevines. And so from 1880, when they got married, to about 1890, Dr. Strenzel, his father-in-law, died in 1890, and they moved up here to the big house. After about 10 years of being a fruit rancher, your spirits were really in the dumps. He said, I'm all nerve-shaken and lean as a crow, loaded with care, work, and worry. Perhaps some of you have been in that same situation yourselves. Well, except for the lean part. What's that? <laughs> well, except for the lean part. Yeah, except for the lean part. <laughs> I know what you mean. Mm. Well, Muir uh, received a letter from his wife when he was out on a little trip one time, and he said, I, the mountains are calling and I must go. And she was just very understanding of his need to go back to the mountains for his, for his <laughs> spiritual. See, I have my little tape recorder over here. I'll see. Okay. So she would let him go back to the mountains. And where did he go? One of the places was right here, Mount Shasta. And Muir went to Shasta 12 times. And one, one day, he and another fellow got up on the summit of Mount Shasta. They'd been doing temperature readings and barometric readings. And it was getting late at night. They had greatly heavy equipment that they carried at the time. And it was getting, a storm was coming in. It was starting to get really cold and snowy. And Muir said, we need to get back down to camp. And the other fellow was kind of, kind of afraid. He just didn't want to go back down. And Muir said, we really need to get going. The other fellow said, I'm really sorry. I can't do it. So Muir said, OK, we'll have to stay up here on the summit all night. So to stay alive, Muir danced the Scotch Highland Flame, you know, to keep his blood flowing. And he, they also laid down these hot sulfuric fumaroles, these hissing fumaroles were coming up from the summit. So they were just, so they laid down on these, they were burning up on one side and freezing on the other. He said they were broiled and frozen all throughout the night. Not a good situation to be in. But they survived that terrible night on the summit and they got back down, happy to be alive. Another place that Muir went in the mountains was Alaska. And this is a painting, that by the way is a painting, another painting by, Tom, by William Keith. This is a painting by Thomas Hill, a reproduction of the original, originally commissioned by Muir for $500, now worth a lot more today, certainly. But this is the Muir Glacier in Glacier Bay, Alaska. Anybody think of other places in America that are named after John Muir? Muir Woods, or and Muir Beach, and a lot of elementary schools, and that kind of thing, named after John Muir. <coughs> Well, Muir really uh, was a true scientist, and he studied glacial action. And he 
studied how they moved across the landscape. A landscape. He put, this is in, in, uh, depicting him in uh, the Wild Glacier or McClure Glacier in Yosemite, and he drove these wooden stakes into the ground, and he could measure scientifically how the glaciers moved up and down the landscape. And his views were kind of controversial because they challenged the orthodox view of the day by Josiah Whitney, the state geologist. Muir called him an armchair mountaineer. And Whitney had theorized from his armchair that the bottom had fallen out of Yosemite Valley in some cataclysmic crash. And Muir said nothing that God created had the bottom fall out of it. And he knew there were living glaciers out in Yosemite and wrote about it. He came pretty famous because of his writings. And I'm going to illustrate how the glaciers moved across. Uh, and this is in Yosemite Valley, see the half dome here, and the glaciers nearly filling up the Yosemite Valley, not completely though. Because it didn't fill it completely, it has implications for us today because there's a lot of loose rock at the top of the Yosemite Valley rim and around Happy Isles Nature Center or Camp Curry, still a lot of big rock falls. And I've been there when there are big rock falls. It's a pretty exciting time to be there. But I'm going to illustrate how the glacier, how the rivers and glaciers move through the landscape. Let's say my hand illustrates a deep V-shaped valley that's cut by the Tuolumne River in Hetch Hetchy, or the Yosemite, uh, uh, the Merced River in Yosemite Valley, cuts the deep V-shaped valley for hundreds and hundreds of years. The glaciers began to form. They grind down the landscape. They open up the V-shaped valleys. They melt away. We have these classic U-shaped glacial form valleys that we have in Yosemite. Muir saw that, he, and he saw the glacial striations on the granite, the terminal moraines, and the lateral moraines, and was able to scientifically uh, write about how they they formed, the, they shaped the landscape. We're going to explore a little bit more of John Muir's glacial adventures in Alaska as we go into the dining room. So here we go. There are some chairs in there, too. That's right. Thanks so much, Sarah. Please do take a seat here over here for a few minutes. Grandpa, take a seat. I pulled that chair out, and I was ignored. <laughs> one of you two. <laughs> okay, well, here we are in the dining room. This is one of Muir's favorite places to be. Truman. And, <laughs> and he loved to tell stories here. And that's how he got his kids, Juan and Helen, to come to dinner on time. He would tell stories. He'd tell them, and he said, I want to be here at 6 o'clock every night when I'm here. And he would tell them in a serialized way. In other words, you'd get to a certain point. And he said, well, if you want to find out what happened, you have to come back tomorrow night to find out what happened. And this kid is one of your favorite stories about a dog, Stickeen, that he met up in Alaska. Now, do you guys have a dog at home or ever had a dog? Do you have a dog right now? Yeah. Okay, what's the doggy's name? Cutie. What? Cutie. Cutie? All right. It's a pretty good dog, is it? All right. All right. You guys ever had a dog? Years ago. Years ago. What was his name? Her name was Amulet. Amulet? That's kind of a cool name. All right. It's a pretty good dog, was it? Oh, yeah. All right. Well, you know what? I have to tell you that I used to be a dog. <laughs> I did. But unfortunately, when I found out I couldn't eat chocolate, I gave it up. <laughs> went, back to being, went back to being a human being. You know, because dogs aren't supposed to eat chocolate, right? And um, this, is here. this is a really cool picture of one of my favorite pictures of John Muir out on the front step here. With, with his hand on the California Sticking Dog's neck or head here. And this is not the Sticking Dog that's the subject of the story, but when he had his dogs here at, at Martinez, he called them all Sticking in honor of this dog he had the great adventure with. Where did he get that name? It's a name after Native Americans in Alaska. Mm -hmm. Good question. So this dog is a dog that um, he met up in Alaska. He'd been, he'd been to Alaska one time in 1879. He proposed to his wife, 
And she said yes, and he took off to Alaska for six months. <laughs> then they got back, and they got married. He took off to Alaska again for three or four more months. So this is when he met Sikki and the dog on his second trip to Alaska. Now, it wasn't his dog, it was a dog he borrowed, or you might say the dog borrowed John Muir, and owned by Reverend Young. And Reverend Young said we want, he wanted the dog to go on a trip. And Muir said, this dog is going to be more trouble than it's worth. It's just a little runt of a dog. What good is it going to be? And Reverend Young said, you know what? This dog can swim like a seal and hike like a grizzly bear. We really need to take this dog along with us. And finally Muir said, well, all right, let's go. So Sikkim jumped in the canoe, and he would jump in and out of the canoe in the icy cold waters there in Alaska. It didn't seem to phase him at all. And one day, Muir and Stickeen were out on one of the glaciers, and he was getting his little feet cut up, so Muir made, made little moccasins for Stickeen and the dog. Well, early one day was a John Muir kind of day. It was snowy and cold and windy and rainy, and he decided to go out on the Taylor Glacier to see what he could find. And he took his ice axe and a little jacket, and he tiptoed out of camp, thinking, well, I'll go out by myself, and no one else will know, but suddenly, boring through the blast, came Stickeen the dog. And Muir said, you know what, go back to camp, Stickeen. This is no day for a dog. It's cold and windy and rainy and snowy. You're not going to have a very good time out here. And Stickeen said to him, whither thou goest, I will go. And Muir said, well, all right, come along. We'll see what happens. And Muir always took a journal with him, and he did little drawings. As I show you the one drawing of the, of the cabin he in, lived in the Yosemite Valley. And he later turned those little notes into magazine articles, over 300 magazine articles and 12 books. And here's Stickeen, waiting patiently for Muir to hurry up and do his journal writing and drawing. I like this image here. Let's see, okay, out, out on the glacier, are these great big deep cuts in the ice called crevasses, and they go down hundreds and hundreds of feet. And Muir said, any competent mountaineer better know what he or she's doing, they'll fall in there and never get out. And he would study them. When he would jump from one side to another, he would study for a while and make sure he, he got across that he could get back, because he might have to come back the same way. But he said, little Sticky and the dog just jumped right on over the crevasses without the slightest bit of hesitation. A little wonder of a dog. And here's the scale, grand scale of Alaska with a tiny little muir and Sikkim out in Alaska. Well, they got to this one crevasse, and the only way across the crevasse was this ice sliver bridge. It was slipped down about 75 feet across there. And Muir looked down there and said, Oh, what a terrible place that is. And Sikkim said, Surely you're not going down there. And Muir said, sometimes we have to risk our lives to save them. So down into the crevasse, Muir went. He got down on his hands and knees and started scraping across the knife edge of the ice as he scooted himself across the ice sliver bridge. Well, he got all the way across, and he looked back and saw Sticky and the dog over here whimpering and crying, saying, what about me? What am I supposed to do? Well, you're going to have to come back tomorrow night. You know what <laughs> That's what Muir did to his kids. You know, say, come back tomorrow night. But you know what? You guys might not be here tomorrow night, so we'll finish up the story, all right? So here's poor little Sticky and the dog, crying and whimpering, wondering, well, how am I supposed to get over there? He finally got up his courage and said, into the valley of the shadow of death, I will go. So he started down into the crevasse. Hi, kids. Then, and he started tiptoeing across the crevasse, and snowing and windy and cold, and he got about 10 feet from the top. And he looked up to Muir, and Muir looked down to him, and Muir thought this dog is not going to make it because dogs aren't very good climbers. And suddenly, up he came in a great big whoosh. He was just the happiest dog Muir had ever seen in his entire life. He said he was afraid the dog would die of joy. <laughs> and he said he just would not be caught. But what this did for Muir, it taught him about the great connection between humans and animals. He called them our fellow mortals. He said, surely a better day will come nigh when godlike human beings will become truly humane and learn to put their animal fellow mortals in their hearts instead of mistreating them so badly. 
So he had a really good connection with farm animals, whether they're pigs, cows, horses, or wild animals as well. So they, brought, they got back to camp that night, just happy to be alive, all nerve shaken, and didn't sleep very much that night. Well, when Muir got back to the mountains, he found things were not going very well from his perspective. People were cutting down the giant sequoia trees and the redwood trees, and the, of course the redwoods are the tallest trees in the, in the world, and there were sheep herding and cattle grazing in the Yosemite Valley, and it had been deeded to the state of California 150 years ago by an act signed by Abe Lincoln in 1864, and that's in that, during the Civil War. And Muir said, any fool can destroy trees for they cannot run away, and even if they could, they'd still be hunted down for their bark hides for fun or a dollar. And the only way to save the trees from fools was, was through action of Uncle Sam. And this is one of the Uncle Sams that John Muir met with. You guys know who this is here? Theodore President. Roosevelt. President? Theodore. Theodore. Theodore Teddy Roosevelt, exactly right. So Muir had a worldwide trip plan, had his bags all, you want to sit down here? Yeah. Muir had a, uh, had, had a worldwide trip all, ready, all planned, had his bags all packed, ready to go, and he got a letter from the President of the United States, Teddy Roosevelt, saying, I want to meet with you, John Muir, in Yosemite Valley. And, and Muir thought about it, thought about it, and said, oh, you know, I've got my bags all packed, ready to go. And his wife said, better meet with the president. So he did. He went out to Yosemite. Three days they camped out, four days they met, three days they camped out, once in the Mariposa Grove, giant sequoias, here at Glacier Point, Yosemite, and once on the valley floor. Well, let's listen to their conversation, see what they talked about. stuffed in pretty well full of stories of the timber thieves and other spoilers of the forest and, and good, good Roosevelt. Before the end of his term, he had set aside more than 200 million acres of land for protection and created five national parks. Bully, bully Roosevelt. Bully, bully Roosevelt, exactly. So... Muir and Roosevelt had quite a time there camping out. And one of the other issues that Muir and Roosevelt certainly talked about was the Hetch Hetchy Valley. San Francisco had a proposal to build a dam and reservoir in the National Park in Hetch Hetchy Valley. And, and Hetch Hetchy's actually been in the National Park longer than has Yosemite Valley. Hetch Hetchy was put in the original grant in 18, 1890. Yosemite Valley wasn't added to the park until 1906 through the lobbying efforts of John Muir, meeting with Roosevelt and others. Muir said, Hetch Hetchy is a grand landscape garden, one of nature's rarest and most precious mountain temples. Imagine yourself in Hetch Hetchy on a sunny day in June, standing waist deep in grass and flowers, as I have often stood with a great pine so dreamily with scarcely perceptible motion. To damn Hetch Hetchy, as well damn her water tanks, the people's cathedrals and churches, for no holier temple has ever been consecrated by the heart of man. These temple destroyers, devotees of ravaging commercialism, seem to have a perfect contempt for nature, and instead of lifting their eyes to the god of the mountains, lift them to the almighty dollar. So, unfortunately, Muir lost that battle, and the, and the Hetch Hetchy Valley was dammed up. Um, here's an image of the Hetch Hetchy Valley with 300 feet of water in it. And this is the Tweelaw Fall. And here said it's the most graceful waterfall I've ever seen. And Wakama Fall here he said it roars and pounds and thunders like an earthquake avalanche. And I've had the, I've been able to hike right up to that tippy top there and experience Wakama Fall as it goes down into the Hetch Hetchy Valley. And a picture of the O'Shaughnessy Dam that I took some years ago out there. You're called it the Dam Dam, Damnable Dam. Now, he never saw the dam himself because he died um, years before it was ever completed in 1923. He died in 1914. So even John Muir didn't get everything he wanted. And like in our own lives, we win some things and lose some, don't we? Hmm. But part of John Muir's legacy is that one person really can make a difference. And that as a one person, he was very instrumental in helping to create about five national parks and other saving other public lands. 
But Muir also found that joining with other like-minded people was really important. And he helped form the Sierra Club. He's the first president of the Sierra Club, an organization still in existence today that encourages people to enjoy and explore and preserve the outdoors. And here's a picture of Muir on the trail to Hetch Hetchy. That's the caption of this picture here. And you see John Muir over here with men and women both on, on the trip. And that was a tactic the Sierra Club and other organizations still use today to get people to go out to places that are being threatened or places they want to preserve and get people to learn about of the place, get it in their bones and their hearts and their minds, and then write letters to members of Congress or meet with members of the Congress or the President and say, hey, we want to preserve these awesome places. So organizations like the Audubon Society, the National Wildlife Federation, the World Wildlife Fund, Defenders of Wildlife, on and on and on, use that same model that John Muir helped develop at the Sierra Club. Okay, we're going to finish up our discussion of Muir's legacy as we go up to the scribbled in upstairs. Okay, here we go. Just a little bit so more folks can come in. That's good. All right. Okay. Well, here we are in John Muir's scribbled den. And this is really the heart of the house. And here's a picture of John Muir sitting here, right there at that desk where he, uh, that's his original writing desk there, where he wrote many of his uh, books and magazine articles and where he administered the Sierra Club and also tried to preserve the Hetch Hetchy Valley as well. And on the right side, side of the desk, you see a Sierra Cup. That's the cup still used today by Sierra Club members and others that they go out on a hike, they dip it in the stream, get a nice cold drink of water. And you see the quill pen there. Muir wrote a lot of his work with the, with the quill pen. Imagine trying to do that today Right, all those books and articles with a quill pen in my hand was just get so tired. I can't even hold. I can hardly hold a pen or pen or pencil for more than a minute or two. And these manuscripts here, you see, with a little red ribbon around it, that was an, that was an indicator to his wife and daughters that they could start editing his books. And one of Muir's favorite words was glorious. The sky was glorious. The earth was glorious. Everything was glorious. And what his wife and daughters tried to do was take out as many glorious as they could. <laughs> And he tried to keep in as many glories as, as he possibly could. Forcing a lot of the glories as he could survive the, the editor's work. Other things on the desk, you see a microscope. Muir is really a true scientist. He believed in the scientific method of Darwin and Humboldt and Asa Gray and Agassiz and other scientists of the day. He was well read, well read in, the in the scientific literature of that day as well. Some other things here in the, in the room. The spear is long, uh, belonged to John Muir. It came back, he brought it back from the Native Americans in Alaska. 
the piece of petrified wood there from the petrified forest in Arizona. One of his daughters, Helen, has some health issues, breathing issues, and they went over to Arizona to live to help him get in more drier air. And the globe there was belonged to John Muir. The baskets were Native Americans in the southwest part of the United States. And pictures here of Muir's daughters, Helen and Wanda, and his wife. Two, two sisters, two twin sisters. He had five sisters and two brothers. Seven brothers and sisters all together. And his sister Mary actually was a painter. Several of his brothers and sisters actually, and sisters-in-law and brothers-in-law came out here to live in the house to help run the ranch when he departed for his journeys and, and lobbying and, and conservation work and mountaineering work. So that was a really good thing for Muir because he could turn over the farm to, to trusted hands with his wife and his, his brothers and sisters-in-law and so forth. So, and his sister Mary painted a pic, painting of Muir, and you'll see it in the, one of the bedrooms over there. That's the original painting that Mary did also. Let's see, other thing, a picture of uh, John Burroughs, a, a naturalist writer from the eastern part of the United States. And Muir and Burroughs were contemporaries. Let's see, uh, William Keith, the artist there, and Keith did these paintings here of the oaks and the scene from the Sierra there. Let's see, picture of his mother, Mary. Uh, uh, right, uh, and, and over there as well. Now he, and no pictures of his father. He and his father weren't really very close. He, they, his father was a very strict Presbyterian Calvinist minister, and it seemed to feel the best way to discipline his kids was through the strap or the belt. And it didn't really endear him too much to his father. Uh, but what I think that did was, and, and Muir worked sometimes 16, 17 hours a day, a long, heavy labor, hard labor on the farm. And one night, he, and his father said, everybody had to get up at eight, go to bed at 8 o'clock every night at the same. You know, we all had to go to bed at 8 o'clock every night. And, but he relented and said, well, Johnny, you can get up as early as you like. Wow, he would get up at 1 o'clock every morning. Imagine that, after working 16, 17 hours a day, getting up at 1 in the morning, he would tinker on his machines. You saw some of the drawings downstairs on the, on the dining room table. And, and he would read a lot as well. One of the machines he had, he later invented, was an be early bed rising machine. Let's say you're sleeping here, and he had it hooked up to some a string, and the, and the sun would cut through the, would burn up the string, set off some gears, and it would flip the bed up uh -huh. like that, and you'd be on your feet ready to go to school. Right? Like a reverse Murphy bed. Right? Mm -hmm. And another bed, he early bed rising machine had, it just would flip you like that and just dump you out on the floor. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> he had a lot of clocks and barometers as well, and his father called him the work of the devil. You know, his father was just not supportive at all of, of his inventions and his work. Forcing year to go to the University of Wisconsin for two and a half years, he escaped, he escaped the farm and was able to go on with his life. All right, well, let's finish up our discussion here of Muir's legacy. And I mentioned that certainly one, one person can make a difference. That's part of John Muir's legacy. Another part is that joining together with other people, you can make even a greater difference. And Muir made kind of an analogy with the glaciers. He said, the, the tiny ice crystals join together in harmonious motion to shape the grand landscape of Yosemite. And he called the ice crystals snowflower crusaders. So I want to encourage each and every one of you folks to be a snowflower crusader, whatever that means to you. If you, uh, if you do recycling of cans and bottles and, and newspapers at home, or if you help out with the Alhambra Creek uh, Beaver Society here, or in the state legislature, you do something there, or the national national congress, or in, in international kind of things as well. Muir really was a citizen of the world, and and believed that all things were connected, and we had to do things to, to support the earth all over the, all over the world. And also, he, part of his legacy is what you see on my patch here: the National Park Service with over 400 sites in the. In the National Park Service, and just ordinary folks like ourselves 
wanting to preserve a place like the Great Smoky Mountain National Park or Acadia National Park in Maine or Point Reyes National Seashore or whatever it might be, we have been involved with helping to save, preserve these great places. And finally, Muir was, uh, his legacy still lives on to the California quarter. And in 2005, there was a big contest as to what was going to be for the California quarter. All, all the states have their own quarter. I grew up in Ohio, and we have two, we have an astronaut and something else, uh, the Wright <laughs> brothers uh, playing on the Ohio quarter. And um, California, a young man named Garrett Burke and his wife and little girl about your age uh, back then, and they helped design, they designed the California quarter, the Muir and Half Dome, and Garrett worked for Pixar and Warner Brothers and Disney, some of the big companies down there. So he was a pretty good artist. And the contest got, his wife is a coin nut. And she said, Garrett, they'd gone to a coin show. And he said, Garrett, get involved in this contest. I said, you know, I'm busy, I can't do this. And she kept, kept after him. And finally he submitted some drawings and got narrowed down to 200, then 20, then five. And finally, Governor Schwarzenegger chose his drawing to be California Quarter, and Governor Schwarzenegger added the California Condor to the Quarter as a symbol of kind of restoration and renewal as well. All right, well, I'd be glad to stay here 12, 13 hours and talk about John Muir if you want. If you have other questions, we'll talk or go down to the bookstore and get some of his books. Where all of his writings are free online if you want to read, read him as well. Thanks so much for coming today. Thank you. Thank You're you. welcome. Thanks. And explore the rest of the house. That has to go up in the attic and ring the bell. Up See, you can't go into the attic and ring the bell. Well, I don't want to ring the bell. I just want to go up into the attic. Ooh, we can do what? Use a pen to mark your favorite park on the pin board. I want a green one. Wait, 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 wait! I gotta mark my favorite park! In this bedroom? I'm not supposed to be taking a nap. Not taking a nap, although I might Let's make my. Eat. Okay, hold on. I'll be right back. Okay. Oh. Okay. Um. okay.